Hey guys, BJ the Brave here, back with a full tier list for the Gene Stealer Cults in Warhammer 40k Warforge. Uh, guys, if you don't know, uh, Gene Stealers have been out about a month at this point. They've had one very subtle nerf, but for the most part, the cards are the same. And yeah, we've had a good month of playing. There's still a lot of cards I want to experiment with. I've got some other deck ideas, but overall, it's a very good faction. I think if you're new and you're jumping in, it's a really cool faction to start with because it's very, very fun and it's got great design. Uh, I wanted to do a review of the cards and where I see the tier list now that I've actually had hands on and we've actually had a chance to see how the, the you know the different cards perform in the meta. So with that said, we're going to dive on in. We're rating cards from 1 to 5. Stars, as you can see here. Uh, a 1 star is kind of unplayable pretty much. 2 are bad cards. 3 are situationally good. 4 are very good cards. And 5 of those S-tier meta-defining cards. So with that said, let's dive on in. Alright, so first of all... Um, the, the perfect host card is an unplayable card for me. I don't understand like what the... What the thinking is really here like what they're trying to achieve per se um creating a neophyte hybrid this is the one three it doesn't have rally it doesn't have anything it just seems like a useless card the subterranean ambush is also pretty pointless because uh unlike the right of restoration that sisters have uh which can obviously bring back a very powerful card for only three energy this one costs five energy to bring it back um i'm not really sure about why the there's cost three, this costs five, other than that's like a, a legendary card and this isn't. Um, you'd have to be running a really heavy late game deck for these to be viable. That's still something I'd like to try at some point, but overall, in most metas, I think this is a pretty unplayable card. Uh, the Aberrant was something that I thought might might be decent, but it turns out it's not because, yeah, if you, if you like, like many cards we're going to talk about today, if you play them with flank, like because this faction does have an ability to give things flank, then then it's suddenly much, much better. But, I mean, we could say that for every card that we reviewed today. Um, I have to say, for 5e, on its own, I don't think it's a good card. Uh, it does come with the armor as standard, which is good. But to gain the vanguard, you've got to attack and trigger ambush. And the problem with ambush as a... Just as a mechanic overall, is it's just not very good, and it's quite hard to trigger, and really the only way you are triggering it is through flank. So what you're then left with is something that um, can be ignored. It's actually quite easy to get rid of because your opponent can just attack its range, and it has zero range, so you've paid five energy and you're not really getting any value back. The other problem with it is, and a lot of the ambush cards suffer from this, is that it is quite easy to predict when your opponent when, when when the gene stealer player plays something plays an ambush card that's high energy and as soon as you see that you just hit the range attack so that's kind of like how you play against it and it just means that it's just not very good now the geonomic enhancement cards there are three uh, we can get these off of other cards for only one energy and they're much better when you do that they're actually pretty good the enhanced resilience gives you uh, armor and plus two health that's one that i use quite a lot uh, but in terms of it being a standalone card that you want to put into your deck list you'd never do that you just never do it i think that one and the enhanced uh, uh the one that gives you plus three strength enhanced uh muscularity i think you can just put those as unplayable cards you want to get them occasionally situationally off of your other cards that just basically produce these for free or for one energy but you, you don't want to be putting these in your deck and i'm going to say the abominant and the hulking a bit abherent i mean you could argue which one's better than the other but they're both unplayable cards they're big big wastes of energy um again your opponent can predict and they're going to attack the range attack and then once they're out the concussive doesn't work because zero range doesn't trigger concussive if they had one range even it would be much better uh but from a law perspective don't make sense that they'd have range so they end up just being big pretty looking cards that do nothing are uh, unplayable don't put them in your deck and the other card that i've also put as unplayable is a bit of a shame really because i kind of like would like to make this card work and again it's pretty good with flank but uh, the problem with the Acolyte Specialist is that, uh, y you know, it, it says ambush, create a sabotage in the enemy. You're never going to get to ambush with this. And for four energy and only four health with one melee, again, it's another one that's pretty easy to cheat the mana and pretty easy to get rid of. So you're never going to get the ambush and you're never going to get to use the blast, making it just a very poorly statted uh, card. 
All right, let's move on to the two-star cards, which are overall bad, but do see play occasionally. So the Gestalt Energy is a bad card overall. Uh, the faction doesn't really have... Uh, it isn't great at going wide outside of um, certain co key combos. Um, but obviously when you do go wide, you've then got to stay stick for the next turn to get the Gestalt Energy off. So this was quite good in the in the Uprising combo deck. If you've not seen um, that, I've got a video guide on that. Also, where have you been this last month? Um, but if you uh, if you play that deck, yeah, I could see you running one copy of this. But outside of that, I've never seen this used. Summon the Colt is a bad card overall, mainly because the two drops that you summon... Um, you don't know what they're going to be, they're random, and also they can come in the wrong order. So say you get the flank one, what you really want is the flank to deploy first, then the other one, then it actually triggers flank, but often it'll happen the other way around. So I just think that it's just too random. There is one thing stopping this card from being unplayable though. Now that is that the Safa Rihanna Warlord, um, her ability allows you to draw troops specifically, or to draw stratagems. And... If you were building a deck where you wanted to control the amount of troops in the deck so that you could have consistency in drawing them, Summon the Cult could be really good because Summon the Cult is a spell that essentially deploys troops. So it has quite a unique uh, function in that in that, um, in that that archetype. Uh, a Trap Sprung, this is the payoff for a really heavy sabotage deck. So it's not unplayable. I've actually seen some people um, uh, saying that, this, that the cards won them games, and I can see that. Uh, but it is five energy. It's going to sit in your hand for a lot of games and do nothing. And it's very, very, very situational. I think overall it's a bad card, but in specific builds, I can see you running one too. Uh, the open insurrection, like a lot of the other cards in other factions that have this, what it does, it gives you vulnerable to your troops this turn. Um, I'd have it as an unplayable card because they, they never played in any of the factions. The only thing that I think is a bit better about this one is it says uh, to trigger uprising abilities. Now, I quite like to build an uprising deck that isn't based around uh, just the co current combo one uh, and try this card and see how it does because I think maybe triggering uprising abilities could be, could be quite interesting. Um, but... Overall, I think it takes way too much setup, and I don't think it's a good card. The Neophyte Heavy is another one of those where, you know, you get a cheeky flank off with this, it can add, it can do a lot of damage, like deals 2 damage and then 5 damage from the range attack. If you've flanked with that, for, for only 3 energy, it's, it's, it's a lot of damage out, but the problem is outside of flank, it's pretty much useless. It's so easy to kill with only 3 health, and so it ends up just doing nothing. And we've got too many good 3 drops in this faction, uh, unlike Sisters of Battle. We've got too many good three drops to be to be to be playing this really. The only exception again is in the combo deck where almost any card that has three or less is good in that because you're basically gonna get play it for free when you when you hit the combo. Now the underground network people might be surprised to see. This is the uh, put a sabotage card in your opponent's hand, and then for the rest of the game, sabotage cards cost one more for your opponent. Uh, there were a lot of high hopes for this card. Uh, I don't think it's as good as it, as um, people thought it might have been. The main thing about this card is that the faction tends to play best when you play it as a tempo deck, outside of the combo build that this is. And this card uh, is just a little bit too slow because you're giving up your turn 4 to play this card and it's just not synergistic with how you win the game so yes it's good at clogging your opponent's hand up but what what you'll find is you'll use this card you'll clog your opponent's hand up and then you'll just lose the game anyway because ultimately you've got to kill your opponent and you kill your opponent by getting their hp down to zero and you do that by building the board and uh, this doesn't allow you to do it so uh if the meta slows down then uh it could get good uh and certainly against control decks that like to have full hands this can really help clog up their hands so uh, uh, you know, this this is one that in future metas could move. It could move. I could see me moving it up to situational, but right now I think it's bad. Uh, as I do the Acolyte Heavy, it's another one of those cards where at four energy uh, with zero range attack, it's just like, 
It's just too easy to trick the trade. It's too difficult to get ambush off. Again, we can we keep having that caveat. But what if you play it with flank? Well, if you play it with flank, it costs more money, uh, more more energy. And there are probably better cards you'd rather use your flank cards uh, than than this. Enhanced aggression aggression is a good card um, when you get it off of um, off of like a biophagus or something like that. But I wouldn't put it in your deck uh, on its own. I think that the one drop infantries are much better if you want to um, trigger ambush but I do think there are certain builds this this is one where I'm probably of all my bad cards this is one where I'm thinking maybe I'm being a bit harsh maybe this could be situational to be fair because uh, you know I could see you I could see you sneaking one or two in but as a card as a standalone I generally would say it'd be bad to play these one that might surprise you and certainly surprise me is lining weight I thought lining weight was going to be one of the all-star cards in the faction but again, on reflection, it's not that it's not that good. You won't see anyone playing this. Like I've not seen any decks where this is really being seriously played. Uh, yes, there's the cheesy combo on E10 where you play the teleportation, steal your opponent's card, and put it back in hand. And I love that that's a thing. I love that it's there. In future metas, lining weight might be better, but right now it's not great. Why is it not great? Well, the problem is, is that yes, it picks a unit up and it puts it back in your hand, only costing one energy. But but that costs you three energy to do. So you. You're going to lose board presence for three energy because it's two energy to pick it up and it's one energy to put it back. So it costs you three energy to lose board presence. So the tempo gain that you get from it has got to be pretty exceptional. And uh, again, like I thought that we'd see this card everywhere, but if you look at what's being played, no one's running this card. Acolyte Hybrid is uh, another one of those cards. The only thing I'd say about this that makes it a bit more better than unplayable is it doesn't have um it doesn't have um the uh oh, sorry it has four health that was the thing that was the reason so for three energy four health's pretty good because um it actually means that you can um survive potentially at that at that energy rate so i always think if you've got one health more than the actual cost then it's pretty worth it uh, hybrid, again, okay, stats for a 2e drop, like, again, having 3 health, uh, but of all the 2e drops, it's the one that's probably not going to trigger, you're probably not going to get the ambush off, but it's not a bad distraction, and it's, it's a cheap drop that you can play on combos, trails, where you just need to play out lots of cheap drops, similar for concealed explosives, um, I would say with this card, I hate this card, um, can't attack with it, ever, there's no putting flank on this, there's no nothing you can do. However, there are some surprisingly out-of-the-box players that you can make with it. Um, I think some people would say this should be slightly higher than bad. What I would say is I think it's a bad card, but I also think it's quite a necessary card in the faction at the minute. We don't have access to much AoE. Concealed Explosives allows you to have some AoE. It's not immediate though, so you have to play it, it has to survive till next turn. How do you do that? Well, you could make it invulnerable, you could trigger it with Backstab, uh, in the mirror match it's pretty good because you can wait for the poison supplies that your opponent puts in your hand and then you keep those, drop this and it obviously triggers the cons. It's a really nice counter in the mirror match actually. So right now, right now I would probably say that this should probably be a 3. It should probably be situationally good. But overall I think it's, a, I actually think it's a bad card. It's, it's not one that I like very much. Alright, next up we got Malak Vorenth. Now sadly uh, the starting warlord um, is is a bad card. Yeah, I, I can't I can't see why you would ever want to play this warlord over the other two once you've got them. Other than you're a beginner and it's the only warlord you've got. Um, I did try an all like a, a flank heavy build, and I think that that might be uh, the strongest argument for playing I Malak, just because he can obviously boost the strength of the things that are uh, flanking. The other thing is Malak is slightly better at uh, removing things in the early game, but it's quite expensive for what he does, and he's just nowhere near as good as the other two Warlords, which are really, really good. All right, let's get on to the good stuff. So the situationally good stuff. These, these are cards that are um, often not great. They might they might sit in your hand, but they can be really good in the right situation. So that's why they are uh, three stars. All right, so the first thing is clandestine operation. Sometimes you want a two drop uh, to develop the board and this uh, is sitting in your hand and you think, ah, oh, this ain't it. So that's the kind of downside to it. 
The upside though with clandestine operation, um, I think this card is 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 better than I originally thought because it's a net it's net bon benefit to you in terms of tempo and value of your opponent, right? Because you pay two energy, your opponent then has to pay two energy to get rid of the thing. So e even on that, but you draw a card, he does not. You're obviously disrupting his tempo play. Where this card's really good though is you want to synergize it, right? So you want to think about like a, a turn where playing a stratagem gives you synergy, like playing it with Nexus or something like that. Um, the other exception is obviously turn one when you don't really have anything to do. You can you can play it there just to kind of disrupt um, disrupt them. So it's all right. Now even the uprising. Um, this is a card that uh, I can't say it's a bad card because making putting things back in your deck and making them three cheaper is is actually quite a powerful ability. The problem is just that the way that the game of Warforge works, it's very rare that games go long enough for you to see the value in that. Uh, I am. I have tested some decks, and I have had some success with this card. Uh, but I think, and I think the legendary warlord works well with this card, where you can keep drawing, cycling troops. So in very slow metas, this is a super powerful card. Um, but it's, uh, and it only costs one energy. That's the other thing, right? So even if you just drew like one or two cards at discount three. Would argue that that's more than made its value back and again it's a stratagem it's a cheap stratagem so when you're looking for triggers uh, of stratagems and we'll talk about some cards that look for that uh, then it can be used the cult lehman rose i like this card you know it's a beginner card it's a neutral card so everybody starts with this um and it's exactly what you'd expect you'd hope to see from a 10 drop it's very playable right like if you're a beginner this is something that you could very much play in the in the, the top end of your curve um, it's got really respectable stats and it has Vanguard which means that it's not useless on the turn that you put it down it actually your opponent really does have to deal with it and if they haven't got hard removal this is not an easy card to deal with so the cool Lehman Russ is uh, it's actually pretty good and the Patriarch is also a card that initially I thought was quite bad and then um, I've started to like this now we've said with all these cards haven't we? we've said oh they're, they're even better if you've got flank well this is a card that is obviously better if you've got flank but this is a card that is worth spending flank on if you can because uh, not only is it obviously going to come on and do 10 damage but it's the fact it gives plus three three to um, range and melee to all of your cards now that includes your warlord guys that means your warlord now is a five five the rest of the game and I think for that alone, it makes it a really good finisher in late game scenarios. Downside though, it does cost 9 energy, more if you want to flank. So it is very, very slow. Kelamorph has been a little bit disappointing. I think people were hoping that this could be an S tier card. I, I don't think it is at all. I think it's a bit of a trap in a lot of decks. It only has 4 range, so it can be traded down and killed even with 8 health at that stage of the game quite easily. Triggering Uprising is not easy. You know, you've got to play an 8 energy Kelomorph and then other cards. How many other cards are you going to play? Yeah, if you get into those E14 games and you get to play this in 3 cards, of course it's going to win you the game, but play 100 games of this card in your deck and see what happens. I, I think you'll be underwhelmed. Uh, the Goliath Rock Grinder is actually uh, a, a seriously solid statted card. Um, and it's one of those where, you know, you drop it and it doesn't do anything, but my god, you better get rid of it. It's almost got a soft vanguard unless your opponent can just win the game. The problem is, is like, at 8 energy, um, it's hard to play these types of cards. Like, it's almost like a real luxury to include this in your deck. Um, I do wonder about a sort of more mid to late game, like, beef deck, if you like, and playing these. Um, but I just think it's a luxury you can't really afford. But don't get me wrong, if you drop this card and your opponent hasn't got an answer, it, it's it's horrific. <laughs> like it's really powerful. Like nine nine damage to face with the four out four blasts taking out things on the side. It's pretty cool. But it, it's a bit of a pipe dream and think think it's um, just just probably a little bit slow. The Acolyte leader's interesting. Like if we do end up in metas where they're very spell heavy, because uh, the the stats are okay. I mean the four health's not great for four. But it can't be cheated with the 4-4 melee range, so it'll trade okay. And um, actually, your opponent can't cast spells, including the Warlord power, without triggering this ability. So they really do... 
It's good when you play it onto an empty board because your opponent has to have a flanking unit to get rid of it. Uh, otherwise, they're going to end up playing spells or this thing's going to survive. So it's actually situationally decent, um, but I think there are better options. The apparent uh, Hypermorph is one of those cards that has zero uh, attack for one of its stats, but is actually not. Not necessarily bad. I wouldn't say it's good either. But if you are looking for a vanguard, and most factions will have deck archetypes where you, 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 need, you need a vanguard, this is the closest thing to the Lich Guard. I, I don't think it's as good as Lich Guard. Costing six energy and not being able to resurrect it, obviously, it's not quite in the same league, but it's not bad. Like, uh, it's, a, it's a solid vanguard. It's just expensive. If you get this off of Magus and you can play it for five, then that's, that's much more like it. Uh, but I think if it was it would probably be a bit too good so yeah it's the best you've got really when you're looking for vanguards cult sentinel is an interesting card i think it's pretty good it's um it's a 5-5 five five, so it can't be cheated it, it'll trade quite nicely and it's another one of those where your opponent it can be awkward sometimes because they can't use spells that you know if, if they play one spell and you get three damage off of it plus this then it's done really well for 5e it's had really good value so it's quite disruptive i quite like the cult sentinel uh, a, a card I probably, again, I probably want to uh, test a little bit more. Maybe that goes in that beef deck I was thinking about earlier. Bore through is obviously the definition of a situation good card, right? If the opponent doesn't have armor, it's slightly expensive to just deal three damage. Um, if they've got armor, then it's really good, right? But I think the, 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 the main reason why I don't think this is a bad card, and I still put it in situational, is that... It can go face, so it gives you it gives you range, doesn't it, for ending the game. The pure strain gene stealer, I had a bit higher than this, but Trigma Males kind of uh, persuaded me that this is. Uh, he might even have this as a bad card. I, I think it's. I think three is about right for it. Like it's a flanker. It will kill something. If something's really important that needs to get rid of, it, it can do a job. And for that reason, I think it's better than a bad card. But it's it's not that great. You actually end up losing tempo quite often when you play this. Uh, because you play it, you kill one thing, but then your opponent can just kill it for free with, like, the Warlord or something. So it it's not great in a tempo deck. It's probably better in a control build, to be honest. So if you were doing, like, late-game sabotage decks or something like that, then you probably would run these, but... Outside of that, uh, I've actually dropped them from like my Magus Tempo decks and stuff. Um, Alright, next up we got the Clamorverse. I think this is an interesting card. It's comparable to the Psycho Mage from Necrons, except for that card only costs 4 energy for the exact same stats. The difference with the Clamorverse is, um, uh, is that uh, it has a talent. His talent, the Vox ha uh, Hacker, is actually really good. Because for one energy, we get to choose a Sabotage. So we choose which one we want and put that in his hand. That's really good for one energy. So if this guy sticks around, like, he's pretty good. He's also one of the few stun things in the in the, in the the faction. We have we have this and... and um, I'm not including these big, horrible, concussive units that we said were unplayable. But we have the three drop and we have the Clamorverse for stun, really. So stun is a powerful ability. Um, it can really help you out in situations. It's just a little bit expensive. It's a, again, it's a little bit slow in what it's doing, but it probably fits a control archetype again. Uh, the Achilles Ridge Runner is mm, it's okay. It's okay. It's, it's it's a definition of okay for me. It's not it's not a great card. Its stats are not are a bit underwhelming. It does help you out against flyers though, um, particular. And obviously, if you're a sabotage deck going down that route, then it does put the sabotage card in your opponent's hand. It's just a little bit meh if you're trying to uh, use it as a flanker to trade up or trade with anything of equal, uh, you know, equal kind of size, like a 6e card. It, it won't do great into that. But yeah, in terms of taking out flyers and stuff, it's 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 useful. It's a lot of energy for what it does, though. So I think it's okay. I don't. I don't think it's a bad card, but I don't think it's a, you know, any higher than three stars. All right, let's get on to the good cards. These are the ones that are going to really make up the staple of your decks. And if you're looking at crafting cards, these are ones that you want to be prioritizing, obviously, along with the S tier cards. All righty. So we got Day of Ascension. The Day of Ascension approaches. Um, forgive me. The Day of Ascension is a good card because it helps you finish the game. We talk about 10e cards doing nothing. This card, uh, whilst often not great, can just win you the game. And I think a 10e card that has that impact is good. 
Um, it, the other thing it can do is clear the board. So it's not quite a Will of Gork, and it's a very expensive Will of Gork. But there are situations where you are playing against, you know, take the mirror match for example, or sisters where there's lots of go wide smaller units in the day of a set, or stealth units as well. It can deal with stealth, which the faction struggles with overall. So day of ascension is quite a nice payoff for sabotage, and um, yeah, it's powerful. I mean, obviously there are there are games where you're going to get this on E3. It's going to sit in your hand for seven turns. You're going to wish it was something else. Uh, but you know, as ten e cards go, I think it's pretty good. And I also think, as a you know, as a beginner, when you when you're starting out, this is something you can start to build a deck around. So it's pretty cool. All right, now the neophyte specialist is one that surprised me. I didn't think it ever put a two drop with two health in good, but this is good because uh, if you think of it almost like a grot, right? When Gaskell plays a grot for two e, we think it's good, and it's all the reasons why is the same reason here. Um, Except for, this is actually giving you the ability to put a Sabotage in hand. So, your opponent has to pay two energy to get rid of that Sabotage. You get to choose it, it's not random, so you pick the one that's most effective. And then it leaves a token, right? Now, okay, they're going to hit you with the melee attack. So, they're only going to take one damage. And they're going to clear it. But... They had to do, they had to spend a turn getting rid of this and spend the two energy that you spent for it. So I think the return on investment that you get from playing this card is good. In pretty much every situation, I can't think of a time where it's not good. In addition to that, it's obviously only a two drop. And the thing about cheap units in this faction is there are a lot of like combos and things that you want to put together. And to, to combo anything, obviously, you're going to need low costing troops. So it's another cheap troop that you can combo out as well. Overall, this card is better and has performed better than I would have thought if I'd just looked at the card in isolation. Next up is the Goliath truck. Now this is a 7 drop, a big meaty card again, a bit like the Goliath rock grinder that we talked about earlier. But I think I feel like 7, this is like a little bit more playable. On 7 energy, dropping something that doesn't do anything that turn, I think it's, a sl it's, it's probably like the last point in the curve where I feel like it's acceptable. Um, it is difficult to get rid of, and it has good stats, and actually when it strikes, it deploys two Neophyte Hybrids, and that is incredible value that you're getting from that. So there's a really good chance that it does survive, and that you're able to to, to do that. And if it doesn't survive, the chances are your opponents have to put some something pretty decent into it. And the other thing is, even with hard removal, let's say they inspired Retribution and kill it, you paid seven, they paid five. It's, it's not the end of the world. It's not like you played, a, you know, a Lehman Russ and they played paid five, and you've lost a lot of tempo there. So, I, I think I think it kind of like sits on that acceptable line for an expensive card. But what it gives you is really good. You know, really solid stats, a real threat on board, and the, the threat of them striking and getting the two near fight hybrids. And it can do that every turn, by the way. I think it's pretty good. The Benefictus is a card I really like. Uh, it gives you removal, instant removal, which is always powerful. And it puts a real threat down on the board. Now you could say, yeah, it's only got five health and three melee. So yeah, it's fairly easy to get rid of. But my god, you better make sure you do. Because otherwise it's swinging back for eight. So uh, Benefictus, I, I, I quite like this card. And uh, it's, a, it's a threat, right? Like if your opponent, if you're playing sabotage cards, if your opponent thinks, oh, I'm just going to ignore that stuff. Or they think, oh, I'm going to keep drawing drawing cards or whatever. Like th this, this then... This then becomes a real counter to, to those kind of uh, control builds that want to hoard value and cards. The living icon is is cool. It's a bit slow, but it's a it's it's a nice legendary to have. Like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of strategies around combos as we've already said. So having a card that can just keep drawing troops, and also if you're playing like cheat troops and you just want to keep uh, cycling through your deck, I think Living Icon's great. And we talked about Eve of the Uprising earlier about putting um, cards back in your deck and making three cheaper. Well, Living Icon is an absolute godsend in that type of deck. Now the Metaphor of Leader I think is also very solid. Kind of like makes me feel a bit like the own she of the deck, right? Like that six drop with probably better stats than Iron Shield, although it doesn't have the shield. Uh, and making everything cost one less. Just that in itself is good, right? Six, six for six. Making your troops cost one less, that's that's actually pretty good. In addition to that, it says give one plus one melee to um, all friendly troops when you trigger Uprising. So again, you can kind of play some pretty nice combos with this, where you make one cost, cost zero. 
uh, or two. Cost costs one and they all come down and then you end up getting uh, plus one on everything. Not bad. Not bad at all. I'd say that it's definitely four out of five stars. I think Backstab is overall a good card. I think having these cheeky strats that are two removal is good when they have an extra ability. And this obviously is helping you remove and then it's putting Sabotage in hand. Now it is random, so sometimes you get the wrong one, but if your opponent's forced to get rid of it, then it's really, really good value. Really good value. So I think Backstab is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a solid, solid card in this faction for sure. And again, it's a cheap strat, so it can synergize really nicely with uh, a few other combos like for example the concealed explosives you can play that on your own concealed explosives and it'll trigger an AoE uh, but the real uh, crux with all these cheap spells is when you combo them with Nexus which is a 4 drop or when you com combo it most importantly with the legendary uh, saboteur the 6 drop which we're going to talk about later all right, now the Metamorph Icon Bearer is a really good card. Yep, solid, solid stats for 5e. E. Slightly weak on the stats, but not not too bad given the rally effect that it has. You know, rally is always better because it happens immediately. Your opponent can't stop it. They can't interact with it. Uh, it's hard to cheat the trade, right? Like the best they can do is go into a 4 drop. So it's slightly understated, but not much. So you won't lose much onboard tempo. What it gives you, though, is 2-2 two, two drops. So, the, you know... Essentially, it's almost like draw two cheap cards. It's it's really great. You get to choose as well. You've got um, two drops. There's only four two drops you can choose from, and you get to see three of them. So, like, you know, you've got a 75% chance of drawing the two drop you want, and I think that makes Metamorph a really nice card. Now, the hybrid Metamorph is... I've put it down as good because it's okay to play down as a four drop, but where this thing gets out of hand as we all know is in the uprising combo when we go off on e8 and we play all of our hand we play this and then we play all of our hand basically and this ends up with like anywhere between sort of you know 11 and 24 <laughs> damage with ridiculous health like it just grows into an absolute giant now in that deck of course it's i mean s tier it's insane but in almost every other situation it's slightly underwhelming so i can't can't I can't quite bring myself to give it a five star because of that. Like I feel like S tier should be good, like always, pretty much. Whereas I can't really bring myself to give this a three when it's it will win you so many games. It's an absolute win con. So I think four stars is about right. As is the case for Locus. Locus is a great three drop. It's one I really enjoy playing. You drop it down on three. It's usually pretty safe with the four health and the stealth, and then it gets to attack the enemy wall and stun something. And I think. You know, in terms of tempo play, but it's already, like, got its value. It's already done its thing. Um, really, really nice. There's a nice thing you can do as well if you're holding this in bi bi Biophagus, where you play the Biophagus on 3, and then on 40, you play the Locus, which goes into stealth, and then you use the 1 energy to um, to from, from the Biophagus's talent to get the Enhanced Resilience, and then when the Locus is about to attack the next turn, you play the Enhanced resilience on locus and you've suddenly got this like stun machine that's pretty beefy and your opponent's thinking oh god i better have an answer to that and if they don't it can kind of run away with it the game uh, next up we got sanctus now sanctus is another one where i thought oh is this s tier there are certain board states where sanctus is absolutely unbelievable he's definitely definitely the target for your flankers so we often want to play this guy with the little one drop that makes flank sanctus is so good with that he is essentially like your hard removal what he does is he has sniper um and when he attacks uh if he if it's from ambush which again is hard to do unless we're using flank but when we do his ability is really powerful because he automatically kills a troop and then he basically kills another troop because it because if he's sniper he gets to do six damage to something that doesn't damage him back now the one downside even with flank which is why i'm not putting him at s tier is that let's say your opponent's got two units you attack one unit it could kill the unit that you were going to a, a trade with 
So there's no, it's a bit random as to which one gets automatically destroyed. Now that really matters because if one of those units is a Broodlord, for example, that's in stealth, you really want the insta-kill to go on the Broodlord, right? So if it doesn't then kill the Broodlord, it kills the one visible unit that you were going to attack, then the whole tactic has kind of backfired and fallen down. So there is a bit of an RNG element, and for me that's just what's... I think that and the fact that I don't like dropping Sanctus without the flank stops him from being S tier for me but I still think he's a good card and as a one of it's very very much worth putting in your deck uh, and last but not least I've got the epic warlord Magus Utherel Nas now Nas is proving very very popular with people it's a really uh, it's a really good warlord why well uh, the talent is uh, enabling you to essentially draw a, a a troop every every turn but it's it's taken from the faction it's not taken from your deck so essentially opens up the entire faction of course you only get shown a choice of three so there's an rng element that's one drawback and probably why i wouldn't quite put it at s tier but when you pay the two energy for this ability it obviously discounts uh, the troop by one as well. So it's a net. It's like a net loss if you were looking to play something the same turn. It's a net loss of one energy. So it's like it's costing you one to get the troop. But you could say, well, but you drew the card. But but it's it's better than that because if I draw a Sanctus and I'm not wanting to play it this turn, I'm willing to play it in a future turn, then it's really good because that Sanctus will only cost four in that future turn as opposed to five. So it's a hard one to evaluate. I mean, overall, it's very, very good. It allows you to fill in your curve, like if you just don't have anything, or maybe you're an early game um, deck and you've been dragged into the late game. Ah, oh, no, never fear. Play Magus and look for those late game cards. So you, you can always fill in your curve. You can also fill in combos. That's another thing that I've really come to love about Magus is that if you're looking for specific combos, maybe I need an Icon Bearer, maybe I need a Neophyte Initiative, whatever it is. Like we can fight, we can use Nas to find the piece that's missing from the Jigsaw Puzzle. So there's a lot of strategy involved with Nas. It's a really, really good card. And it's, it's one of the leaders where I think this is why I'd say, if someone asked me right now, I'm new to the game, BJ. What faction should I collect? I, I would wholeheartedly recommend Gene Stealers because I think they're a really, really good faction overall. And the warlords that you can use and the variety that they bring adds a lot to the experience of like deciding which faction to go with first. And I, I think Nas is one of those. Just like dive in, you'll have you 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 there's loads to learn. There's loads of things you can do with him for sure. All right, uh, enough gnashing over Nas. Let's go on to our five star. 5 out of 5, must have cards, absolute S tier, transforming the meta, what have we got? Well, I think, uh, and I have done these in order, by the way, I do think like left to right, the left ones are the kind of, if, if I, I say like that's better than that and that's better than that, I try to do that. But these are all S tier, right? So I have got Safa Rihanna up there. Now, I don't know what everybody else thinks, let me know in the comments. By the way, if you're enjoying this, guys, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel for more Warforged content. But... For me, I think that uh, Safariana is uh, slightly better than Nas, and uh, the, 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 they're very close in power. I think what it comes down to for me is, at the highest level, I think Rihanna is uh, the, the ability to choose what you need really favours the kind of skill player, right? This, it's, it's a really high skill kind of warlord, but it gives you control over the fl and flexibility. So... For two energy, I can choose a stratagem, I can choose a troop, or I can heal. So what do I need in the situation? The other key thing about this is that I can actually build my deck list around those mechanics. So if I build a deck that only has, like my current deck that I'm climbing with this season, is, is um, I started out with Nas and I've moved over to Rihanna. And what, what Rihanna uh, allows me to do is I build a deck that has six stratagems in it. I know I can pretty much guarantee every game the stratagem. Now, when one of those is Telepathic Dominion, which is a late game card, it kind of means in almost every game I get to actually use that finisher. So it's it's actually quite powerful when you think about uh, building a deck that you're going to play 100 games with. How good is it across the 100 games? And I think that's what makes this card an S tier Warlord because it brings a degree of consistency that is pivotal when you climb in. Now, I think Nexus is a wicked card. Like, four energy uh, stealth, always good for a start. Just with that alone means that it's a nice tempo card. It can trade and keep up with board. 
But this card can do so much more, right? What it says is artifice your unit, that includes your warlord, your units gain plus one melee until the next turn. So it's plus one melee in the turn that we're, we cast the spell, and then in your opponent's turn as well, if you're playing against Tyranids or Orcs or Chaos, where they have a, you know, over-reliance on melee attacks, that can be really, really powerful even in their turn. Nexus is also a, a surprise finisher. Like, uh, one of the things you can do is play down Nexus, and then in the next turn, because of the stealth they survive, in the next turn you drop your second Nexus and go off on spells, and you can end up with doing 20 plus damage. Like, you can do a ridiculous board with that in the late game. So it scales well in, in the late game, and it's good in the early. Perfect Ambush is super, super solid. Sorry. Perfect Ambush is a really great card. It's a 1E e stratagem, so it triggers Nexus, it triggers Saboteur, um, but most importantly, making something invulnerable till the start of the next turn. We know how powerful this effect is from Humanity Shield in Ultramarines, and more recently through uh, from the uh, the Sisters of Battle, the Adeptus Sororitas card. I'm forgetting the name of it. You know what I mean. The 3E e card that makes something invulnerable. We get this for 1E. E. Now, we can't use it on our Warlord. It's the one downside to this card. But my goodness, you stick this on the right card. And I often like to target something like a big uh, hybrid metamorph or a neophyte leader or a nexus or an icon bearer or a saboteur. Uh, all of those are wicked targets for this. And it often wins me the game, quite frankly. Um, all right, let's look at the telepathic domination. Probably my favorite card in the faction. When I saw the design of this, I've, I've had this in other games. And I've always wanted a card like this in Warforge, and um, it just feels good, man. It just feels so good. And it's it's a cool finisher, like, um, w your opponent will try to play around it. I, I, I had a game the other day where I stole Makari. I spent eight energy to steal Makari because I needed to do three damage. I stole Makari, hit with a Warlord, and I, and I won. Um, super good card, super good finisher. Uh, love that card. Gene Steeler Familiar, absolute world beat of this card. For 1e, it gives adjacent units. It's basically a Makari effect, right, with the with the plus one melee to adjacent units. So one of those will be a Warlord. The other one will be usually something that you're going to use. It's Rally On, which gives flank to a friendly infantry. So this is the cheapest flank uh, enabler that we have. Absolutely love this card. Solid. You should probably be running two of these in every single deck. It is phenomenal. Again, Sanctus is probably the main... Um, you know, one of the main targets for this, but there's lots of targets. You can imagine playing this on a Goliath truck. You can imagine playing it um, just just on a just when on the turn you play Icon Bearer and you want to get more near fight initiatives, for example. So it's so many combos. It's it's just a brilliant card. The near fight leader is also fantastic. I think this card is one of my favorite cards in the faction. It enables so many combos. We can play this out with the uprising combo, but it's not just that. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to drop the Reductor Saboteur which is in stealth, and then the next turn you drop your Neophyte Leader, and then you just play all your spells. And every time you play a spell, it drops a Concealed Explosive, but the Neophyte Leader then buffs it as well, right? So everything's getting buffed. It's just a really good combination. And there's so many other combos as well. Like, this card is just phenomenal. The Neophyte Troop is the best two-drop in, in, in the faction, for sure. Like, a flanker, essentially, that... Uh, you know, the only downside is you just wouldn't play this on its own on E2, but it's not meant for that. Uh, otherwise, it's a really good card. Uh, you play another card, and it gets a, a buff to its range attack. So for two energy, we can we can be a flanker that ends up having like five, six damage, um, and can take something out that costs a lot more than two E. So it's a really good return on investment. The rampant infestation. This is now obviously seven energy. They, they haven't updated the card art from on the web on their website, which is where I got this from. But it's actually cost seven energy, and uh, we all know in the first season this card was broken. Uh, it enabled a combination where you just had loads of cheap units that cost three or less. You play the rampant infestation on turn six, and you vomit out your entire the entire board, play all sorts of nasty combos. Uh, it's now seven energy, so it's just as good. It's just one turn slower, basically. I still think it's an S tier card. It'll still win you ridiculous amounts of games, and it's a, still a hard combo to answer. Uh, next up, we got the Biophagus. I really love this card. This is how do you how do you create a three E card that has terrible stats and is still a good tempo card? 
Well, biophagus is the answer to that. And it's a really interesting one to analyze from a kind of card design perspective. Because if you just looked at those stats and didn't read the thing, you'd be like, what is this horrible card, right? But the stealth, meaning it sticks on the board, the rally, putting put in the, probably the worst sabotage in your opponent's hand, they're going to want to get rid of it. So they have to pay 2e. And you just think if it's their, e, their turn where they're on e3 or e4, and then they're like, oh, I've got to spend two energy getting rid of... But you've already messed up their tempo. It's such a good disruptor, this card. On, in, and then in addition to that, you've got stealth. So the next turn, it's then got a talent, which allows you for one energy to get access to the um, three dynamic enhancements. So we can get resilience, we can get strength, we can put a flank uh, stratagem in our hand for late, later in the game, which is, which is often a great option. So it's it's just phenomenal. It's giving us access to cheap stratagems, which can again combo off with Nexus or Saboteur. There's so much flexibility in the way that this card can work. And then it's got three health, so even after the stealth, you don't have to attack. And most Warlords can't get rid of it. They have to put extra resource in to get rid of it. So it's, man, it's the ultimate kind of like disruptor. It's, it's great. Um, the only cards that I think are better than Biophagus, I think the Neophyte Icon Bearer is superb. I mean, I've had so much fun with this card. By the way, it's one of my favourite artworks in the game. absolutely love that card. Uh, but I just feel like uh, there are so many mini combos where you just have two or three units down and you're able to attack with them. And then the Icon Bearer gives you two to three Neophyte initiatives. And we all know how powerful those turns can be when you play two or three initiatives and then a load of stuff. Superb. Speaking of which, that's why I got the Neophyte Initiative in there. The Day of Ascension approaches. This card has been insane. It's unique in the game. It um, can be used in more than one way. To start with, we saw the kind of big rampant infestation combo. But I think we're seeing more nuanced ways of using it now. It can help you get rid of stealth. It can help as a finisher. It, it can help develop a wide board. Again, you can have these turns where you play the Saboteur down, and then the next turn you play, uh, like we talked about, Neophyte Leader, you can play like one or two initiatives and then just vomit out all your cheap spells. And all of the extra concealed explosives that come out trigger the Neophyte Initiative to ping, so that's how I win most of my games, to be honest. It's a phenomenal card, there's some, tons of ways to use it, it makes the faction a lot, a lot of fun. It's, 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 it's not just a card that you use in a pure Uprising deck. You have to learn how to use this with all of the different combos in the faction. And I think the only card that I can I can rate higher than that Neophyte Initiative is the Reductor Saboteur. This card is phenomenal. Like <laughs> When I first got this card, I thought, oh yeah, this is a really good card, right? Because it's got stealth, and then you get to attack for 5e, and then you do Blast 4. Just that in itself is, is pretty good. But that is barely scratching the surface. What makes this card amazing is the artifice um, combination with the stealth, right? Because as as I've alluded to as we've gone through this uh, this tier list, the amount of cheap spells that you have in the faction. And by the way, we talked about Rihanna being an S tier warlord. Remember Rihanna? You can play the wall the, the talent, which is which is a stratagem, and then use that to draw a stratagem. So if you're playing Rihanna, you've always got access to two stratagems, even if you didn't have any any in your hand at all. That is a really important combination with Saboteur. Uh, and so, yeah, you can play the Saboteur down, you can play off combos with a Neophyte Initiative, you can play off combos with um, uh, the Neophyte Leader. Uh, if you've got a backstab in your hand, like you can, you can imagine a get turn where you play Saboteur, then you use Rihanna to draw a um, to draw a stratagem. You draw backstab, and then you backstab your own, you know, one of your own uh, con concealed explosives. That draws you another concealed explosive because it's a stratagem. I mean, it just—it's just insane, like the amount of like value and combos. This, this 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 combo is kind of something I look for in almost every game, and and it pretty much wins you the game whenever you get it off. So, uh, yeah. Overall, guys, I think they did a good job with the Gene Stealers. I think the ambush mechanic is a little bit meh, a little bit wanting. But overall, I feel like they've got um, they've done a good job. Um, there are some powerful cards, but they don't feel like completely OP as a, as a faction, like, say, Tau did when they first came out. Um, 
whilst not having too many really miserable cards. Even some of these what cards that I've said are bad cards, you'll still run a Trap Sprung in a specific deck. You'll still run Underground Network in a specific deck. You still can. There'll be future metas where Lion in Wait or Enhanced Aggression can be used. So a mark of a good design faction, I think, is where all the cards have like at least some utility. There are very few unplayable cards. So overall, guys, really enjoying the Gene Steelers. Hope you like that. Please like this video. Hit that thumbs up down below. And if you're not yet subscribed to the channel, I know about half the people who watch my content aren't actually subscribed. So um, I do mainly Warp Forge, a little bit of Magic the Gathering. Uh, so if you're interested in that and want more content, then hit that subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Appreciate you. And I'll see you in the next one. Ciao for now.